Sean Kierkegaard lived from 1813 till 1855. One may argue whether he was a philosopher or a Christian theologian, but he was certainly a theist and specifically a Christian theist occupied with questions concerning man's existence and widely considered the first existential author. While his authorship may dwell on despair and guilt, the key word for Kierkegaard is joy. He worshipped everyday life even though he was never able to enjoy it himself. He did, however, spend his entire authorship in identifying the conditions for living an authentic and joyful life in accordance with oneself and God. Kierkegaard's life was not marked by many dramatic events, but the disastrous engagement with the 17 years old Regina Olsen is central in the understanding of Kierkegaard. The 10 years older Kierkegaard had expended all his charms to force an engagement through, only to instantly realize that he was incapable of going through with the engagement. Following a year's agony, he forced her to call it off in the brutest of manners, and it was the scandal of the town. He never forgave himself the affair that plays an integral part of his authorship, but it also made him one of the greatest philosophers ever and one of the few that really broke new grounds. It is a condition for man, says Kierkegaard, that while he is born as a, born as a man, that only means that he is born with the possibility of becoming a man. Man's immediately given reality is a lost reality, and one only becomes a man when one has identified oneself with the specific abilities and environmental circumstances one is beforehand and have made them one's own. If a person does not undertake the process of realization, the development of the self will not materialize. Instead, man will lose himself into all that he immediately is and become a mindless cog in a machinery destined to function in the manner the machinery forces it to. Kierkegaard calls this person the Philistine. The Philistine is a product of what his surroundings and culture will make of a person with his talents and dispositions. Hence, the Philistine lives in despair, says Kierkegaard, since his life is not dependent on himself but on conditions outside himself that he is a mere slave to. A Philistine is always a Philistine without knowing he is a Philistine. But what happens when he discovers the self-deceit? Well, now he really despairs, because now he no longer despairs over something specific, but because he discovers that, in essence, he has always been living in despair. If the Philistine cannot shake off his unsettling mood, he becomes an ascetic. This is a difficult concept, but it may loosely be defined as uninterested enjoyment, that is, a state of mind where one takes pleasure without being soothed to expend any energy. Aesthetics are always on the lookout for passion, but on principle never engage themselves. Like Don Juan always looking for the next woman to, to seduce, they remain intentionally uninterested and liken life to a theatrical play, a farce, a grotesque and absurd drama with no coherence or meaning. For an aesthetic, it is logically impossible to make a decision since nothing matters and everything leads to the same. That is why one of Kierkegaard's aesthetic characters in his debut novel, Either All, can say, marry and you will regret it. Do not marry and you will regret it. Whether you marry or you do not marry, you will regret both. In order to make the transition from the aesthetic to the ethical, one must not live in despair. One must choose despair. This can sound counterintuitive. If I am a bit lazy and I want to be more energetic, should I not choose to be more energetic? If you think this way, then you have not fathomed what to choose means. To choose is to will. And when one chooses oneself, when one wills oneself exactly as one is, it has consequences. Consider an alcoholic. He is in deep despair and would more than anything like to choose himself as one that is not an alcoholic. But then he could only become identical with himself once he has overcome his alcohol, uh, alcoholism. 
His struggle against alcoholism will become desperate and if he fails, he will break completely down since it is his very self he has lost. If instead he chooses himself as an alcoholic, he is identical with himself also when he drinks. He can still try to quit his alcoholism, but he no longer tries so desperately and if he relapses, he won't despair because he is reconciled with himself also in his misery. To exist in this manner, reconciled with oneself because one fully and completely have said yes to oneself, that is, in Kierkegaard's view, the road to a sound mental health. But it is more than that. It is fulfillment of the ethical demand and the only manner in which personal responsibility can come about, but then as a full responsibility. A responsibility that cannot be relativized or limited. When man chooses himself, he becomes the cause of himself. This means that if you are an alcoholic, it is your responsibility. You have willed it and chosen it. It may very well be you had a tough upbringing, but when you choose to will yourself, you have the full responsibility for what you do. And whatever you choose to do, you can do so without desperation or despair, for in choosing also lies reconciliation and reassurance. For Kierkegaard, this act of choosing turns everyday life into a joyful duty. Duty may sound boring, but let's consider love in this light. The aesthetic loves for his own sake. He loves what the beloved can do to or for him. The ethical, on the other hand, loves for the beloved's own sake. For the ethical person, the idea of love is not what he can receive, but what he can give. It's important to emphasize that this understanding of love takes away nothing of the beauty in love. To the contrary, an ethical love is always young and new because it does not depend on a feeling but is based on attitude. And feelings can be deceitful, but the attitude is firm. However, existence can become even richer, says Kierkegaard. To understand how, we must first understand his analysis of the repetition. The question Kierkegaard poses is, is it possible to repeat, that is to take up life again even if one's world has been shaken to the core? To answer this question, Kierkegaard analyzes the story of Abraham in the book of Genesis that is commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. For Abraham, the command amounts to a complete break with everything that is ethical. In reality, it is not just Isaac he kills. He kills all meaning, rationality, and coherence in the world when he kills his son. Hence, Abraham's world can only be saved if one can point to a purpose that can justify breaking an ethical demand. This Kierkegaard calls a teleological suspension of the ethical. But what purpose could possibly suspend an ethical demand? Only a religious purpose can suspend an ethical demand. Only God can suspend an ethical demand. But this raises a new question. Is it possible to live an authentic life in unity with the ethically ordered society if God and the religious can suspend the ethical? Yes, it is possible, says Kierkegaard. The key word is faith. Faith entails that Abraham first resigns indefinitely. When God demands Isaac of him, he bows to the demand of God without hesitation, gives up Isaac and resigns indefinitely on him. But right after Abraham performs the opposite movement, he believes. And in his faith, Abraham receives not only Isaac back, but the entire meaning of existence. Kierkegaard's fictitious writer, Johannes de Silencio, that makes the an analysis, admits that he doesn't understand it, but rationally he can determine that Faith is only faith when it is faith by virtue of the absurd. Faith lies beyond rationality and common sense. Faith is what takes over when common sense has reached its limits. Otherwise, it would not be faith. So, there is no rationality in faith. We hope in God. And God is the unfathom unfathomable from whom we can expect the unexpectable. And hereby the religious has been established as a new, 
higher and separate dimension in existence. But how does one go from the ethical to the religious existence? Living religiously implies a duality. One must simultaneously live in a religious relationship with the world and in a relationship with God. Living religiously in relation to the world is to choose oneself and realize one's being as the unity of individual and society. Or as it was stated earlier, you must choose what you are, where you are. The, the relationship with God is of a completely different nature. The religious is a new passion, faith by virtue of the absurd, the infinite love unto God as sheer possibility. And here it is again, passion, the central aspect in existence. For the aesthetic, the passion was everywhere and nowhere. For the ethic, it was directed at his fellow man. But for the religious, the passion has found its final object, God. And how is this expressed then? Well, it cannot take any concrete form, but it shows constantly in the way man relates to the world. That's the point. The content of one's existence hasn't changed the slightest, but one's attitude towards that content is radically new, and it is in this change the religious is expressed. The religious person receives every second of life as an infinite gift and lives in a never-ending marvel of the wonder that is life. This does not mean that the religious will, will make all your worries and suffering disappear, but it will offer you a new attitude towards the tribulations. Life, such as it is now for me, has been given to, to me by God, and th therefore the verdict is that it is absolutely and unquestionably good. Without the religious point of view, all happenings in life are essentially mean because we are lost to them, a plaything of their randomness, volatility, and uncertainty. But by the religious, by the relationship between faith and God, they all become good since they all flow from the Father of Light. Kierkegaard was a firm believer in God, and in Kierkegaard's view, Christianity separates itself from all other religions by being a historic event, a divine intervention in history where God became what he cannot be, a man. This event changed everything. The dogma of the incarnation that God became a man is in its essence Christianity. And for Kierkegaard, Christianity is not a religious teaching, but a passionate message of existence. The key word again is passion. Everything that relates to man's existence, one cannot simply know of. One must have acquired it deeply within one's own existence for it to become a personal truth and reality. This is why Kierkegaard says that the truth is subjectivity and that passion is the truth. But note that faith in the first order does not mean faith in something. One can, for instance, believe in Jesus as the Son of God, but having that belief does not mean that one has faith. Only when one's faith is internalized is it truly faith, because now it represents an attitude that goes hand in hand with one's reconciliation and reassurance with oneself and one's conditions. Kierkegaard was wary of the democratic reforms in the mid-19th century because he feared that in a democratic society that individual would disappear. That is the idea that a man, the individual, in order to function properly in a society must first find, must first find himself. But democracies do not appeal to that individual, but to the masses. And Kierkegaard has the deepest mistrust of man when he becomes part of a mass. As part of a mass, the IQ level plummets, but what is even worse is that man, as part of a mass, never takes personal responsibility. Everybody just goes with the crowd, and a democracy will therefore be a tyranny far worse than a kingdom. Kierkegaard blamed the church that it had joined the masses in their cries for democratic reform instead of calling to order and tearing the masses apart. This, this was not Kierkegaard's only grief with the church. He also blamed the church its preaching of Christianity. The root of the conflict is the stories of Jesus. 
On the one hand, there are no limits to the kindness of Jesus, while on the other hand, there are no boundaries to his rigor. Kierkegaard cannot get a grip on how the two roles relate to one another and how one can claim both at the same time. But perhaps, he concludes, the answer is that Christianity lives in the tension between the two ultimate demands. Therefore, he argues, it represents a destruction of Christianity if one exclusively refers to the one, and Kierkegaard became increasingly convinced that this is what the church did. It had forgotten the rigor of Christianity and distorted Christianity into a soft and cuddly sentimentality. The church therefore had to admit that what it preached was not actually Christianity, but a softening of Christianity. These dis disagreements led to the so-called church storm that Kierkegaard fought the last seven years of his life and where he put himself at odds with the entire clergy in a public spectacle whose like has never been seen before or after. But one major question arises from those years. Did Kierkegaard change his mind in the years from 1851 to 1854? There certainly is a change in several of his concepts, and he now seemed to say that it is impossible for man on an earthly level to live up to the demands of Christianity, which is in stark contrast to everything he had said so far. One can only guess, but perhaps the content of his final writings were meant as a thesis to which he would later posit, posit an antithesis. In the tension between the two, a synthesis of truth would then reveal itself. Before he could posit an antithesis, however, he collapsed on the street and died at the hospital on November 11, 1855. With those words ends this introduction to Kierkegaard. He takes patience and effort to read. But if you take the time, he is a treasure house of positive outlook, regardless of whether you believe in God or not. Especially his ideas about choosing oneself to value attitude over feelings and finding eternity in every moment offers lots of inspiration. But more than anything, perhaps his idea that life's darkest and most troubling moments are also the best moments for growing as a person can offer solitude and hope if and when life is weighing you down. Enjoy reading him. Thank you.